As we already discussed, Greek was such a fertile land, not only for olives and grapes, but also for mathematics. It gave us the modern rules of democracy and diplomacy. It also gave us the modern roots of mathematics. Of course, that means that Euclid was by far not the only person who was working on mathematics and the mathematical foundations, as well as physics and astronomy, as again can be seen in this School of Athens, picture by Raphael in the Vatican. So let's go down the list of some of the most important figures in Greek mathematics of the ancient times. Now, I'm not going to do any justice to any of these figures. I'm going to only mention names in the hopes that you will look them up and see what kinds of achievements they have managed to reach long before there was mathematics as we know it. Thales, the first philosopher in the Greek tradition, sometimes called the father of science, was the first person to really introduce the, uh, to take away the mystical and really introduce the naturalistic theories and hypotheses. He is known to take the deductive reasoning that we still use today and have produced the Thales theorem and several corollaries to it. Zeno, one of the most lovable people from the Greek antiquity, because he's responsible for his paradoxes that have puzzled mathematicians for centuries, such as to go from one point to the next, you have to first travel half the distance. And once you're here, you have to travel half of the remaining distance and then half of the distance and so forth. So you'll never actually get there because you always have half of something to cover. Moving along chronologically, we have Plato, one of the most important and influential individuals in the entire human history. His teacher, Socrates, and his most famous student, Aristotle, have also, of course, built together the discipline of philosophy and, in general, the way that we think about knowledge. Plato himself thought that all knowledge comes from the world of ideas, and then the human body is so imperfect that one must almost fight their natural tendencies in order to avoid um, somehow contaminating the world of ideas. So in Raphael's painting, Plato is displayed as pointing up to the heavens where the knowledge actually comes from. Next up, we have Plato's student Aristotle that has given us our methods of inquiry, that pointing toward the earth, toward the humans in Raphael's painting, points out to us that all the hypotheses have to be tested in the physical world. They have to come from the human understanding of the actual world. His philosophy is actually seen to have influenced almost every single form of human knowledge to this day. Eudoxus is not the name that you hear as much as, let's say, Plato and Aristotle, but he is considered to be one of the greatest philosophers in classical Greek mathematics. Um, he is the source of most of the book five of Euclid's Elements on proportions and so on. He is the one that developed the method of exhaustion that is, in some sense, the very foundations of integral calculus. We have, of course, talked about Euclid, and we will talk about Archimedes in a lot more detail. Um, but we also have people like Xenodorus, who, for example, proved that a regular polygon encloses a larger area than any other polygon of the same perimeter. And this isoperimetric problem, not found in Euclid or Apollonius or Archimedes, is one of his sort of unique achievements. We have Hipparchus, the greatest astronomer of antiquity. He's considered to be a founder trigonometry, and is actually almost famous for discovering the precession of the equinoxes. We have Apollonius, who gave us the study of conic sections that we have several of the Greek and Arabic translations of. We also have Heron that you can look up and is, for example, is famous for its namesake formula for the triangle area. Um, next comes Ptolemy, who is, of course, a famous astronomer and physicist who we will also talk about later, and in some unknown ways is famous for misleading Columbus into finding America instead of India, as he set out to do, because Ptolemy's works have survived him by thousands of years. 
Diophantus is somebody we're going to also talk a little bit more about later and is famous for leading Firma to write in the margin of his book about his very last theorem. Pappus is um, one of the most original and creative commentators of the Greek geometry. He is the person that, in many ways, we owe the commentary of um, Euclid and the discovery of some of the original Euclid's elements as a source, as well as Theon and his daughter Hypatia, the very first female scientist, um, that are commentators and the editors of the works of Euclid and the preceding mathematicians pulling together the works and compiling really rich commentaries and really rich descriptions of the works that the culture has managed to accumulate. These are not by any means all of the Greek thinkers, philosophers, mathematicians, physicists, astronomers. This is just a small subset of them. It is such a rich area of study and history. Look up these names and go down the rabbit hole of Wikipedia and YouTube just to get a sense of how rich and versatile Greek mathematics and philosophy really was. We will spend a little bit of time discussing Archimedes and his works as just one example of the Greek antiquity and how mathematics was developed through a slightly different lens. Archimedes was born in Syracuse and he spent most of his life there. He actually grew up in a fairly privileged circumstance. His father was a famous um, astronomer and he was closely associated, maybe even related to the king of Syracuse. He started in Alexandria and perfected many of the ancient Greek techniques. He was a talented mathematician and proved many of the rigorous mathematical results, such as, for example, the fact that the surface of any sphere is four times its greatest circle. But apart from that, he also made advances in a variety of different disciplines. Although Archimedes devoted himself to pure mathematical research, he's actually fairly known as an intelligent engineer with many of the different constructions. And often his genius was called upon to develop various engineering devices um, for war purposes. So what we see here are devices that are based on the lever or the mirrors, as well as, of course, the famous Archimedes screw that is still used today to leverage water or grain from the bottom to the top on some kind of surface. He did not enjoy or take pride in these inventions, and this is the reason we have very little record of them, mostly based in the descriptions of other people. Many of us are likely familiar with the story that when um, Archimedes was asked to approximate the weight of the gold in the queen's crown without actually pulling it apart. And he was bathing at the same time and realized that when he lowered himself into the water, the water level has risen and therefore likely actually displaced the same amount of volume as his body has introduced. He screamed Eureka and ran down the street naked in happiness of the discovery. This resulted in a study of hydrostatics on floating bodies of his. In fact, overall, we have about 10 of the Archimedes works saved in a fairly complete collection. He also studied the motions of heavenly bodies in his treatise of, on sphere making. He also um, is fairly famous for developing what we would probably now call applied mathematics, the study of geometry and mechanics coming together in the method of the mechanical theorems. This particular manuscript actually has a fascinating history. So many of Archimedes' works have been preserved through the copies of scribes who passed down his work through the generations of writing it down. And in the 10th century, one copy of the method was made. But in the 12th century, in the 1200s, a medieval scribe basically ran out of parchment paper and decided to recycle the 300-year-old pages into a book of prayers. He trimmed the parchment, he erased the existing text of Archimedes, turned the pages 90 degrees, so you see the mathematical text pointing in one direction and the prayer text pointing in a different direction, and then simply inked on the prayers. This is called a pamphlet set, and this particular one turned up quite mysteriously in a library in Constantinople in 1906 before going missing again and turning up on an auction in New York in 1998. 
Today's technology has made it possible through the imaging technology to actually fully recover Archimedes text that has been erased and then replaced on top with the prayer text. In the method, Archimedes presents the discovery by mechanics and then states the result. The two essential features of this is the fact that he thinks of every figure as composed of its cross sections. So, for example, a cone would be a collection of various spheres, much like we think now in terms of methods of volumes of revolution. And the second one is the law of the lever. He utilizes this law of the lever to actually calculate areas, volumes, centers of gravity, and so on. And we will see another video where even laws of statistics can be thought of being developed and justified through the law of the lever. In order to structure this rigorous approach to mechanical understanding of mathematics, he actually creates a mathematical model for the law of the lever. And thinking back as to how Euclid lays out his axioms and postulates, Archimedes follows the exact same scheme. He introduces postulates to his work, from which the rest of the theory gets developed. So here they are. Equal weights at equal distances are in equilibrium. So if you're thinking of a balanced scale, so let's say you have the balance in the middle, if you put equal weights, equal distances away from the center, they will be in equilibrium. And equal weights and unequal distances are not in equilibrium, but inclined toward the weight that is at the greater distance, and so on and so forth. He uses these postulates and proves the rest of his results in a very rigorous mathematical manner, relying on nothing but what he has postulated and what are the axioms and common notions to his method. Let's see how this works in the first proposition of the method of mechanical theorems. Proposition one of the method. Weights with balance at equal distances are equal. How are we going to prove this? Well, let's take a look. First of all, we're going to apply contradiction argument. Isn't this wonderful? Archimedes, 200 BC, proved by contradiction. If we're going to contradict something, we need to figure out what that is. And in this particular case, if we're looking to prove that weights with balance, which balance at equal distances are equal, we're going to suppose that scales balance, but weights are not in fact equal. What we're going to do next then is take away from the larger the difference of the two weights. So let's go back and actually draw ourselves a picture because this is a mechanical proof and it will really help to visualize what's happening. So I have the scales that balance, although weights in fact are not equal. And we're going to want to take away from the larger the difference of the two. It doesn't really matter which one is the larger, so let's suppose that A is larger. And from that, we're going to take the difference of the two. So from A, we're going to take away A minus B. Now, by postulate 3, if the weights did balance and then you took something away, they will no longer balance. But now if we took away a minus b from here, we have weight b here. And of course, we didn't do anything to this, so this remains b. This, of course, contradicts the very first postulate, saying that equal weights balance at equal distances. Contradiction, and we're done. Isn't this beautiful? A very rigorous proof relying on the postulates that have been actually claimed, and a very particular mathematical technique, a very precise, rigorous mathematical approach. The rest of the method proceeds in a similar fashion and also following in the tradition of the elements builds upon itself. So propositions 6 and 7 are actually what is called the law of the lever, the consequence of which is Archimedes' famous quote, give me a place to stand and the lever long enough and I will move the earth. Now, the method wasn't his only mathematical achievement, although this is a quite a different lens to look through at mathematics and a mechanical or applied mathematical approach to it. But we will also see how he laid foundations to what we now know as calculus. Archimedes actually came up with the first recorded method of computing pi to any degree of accuracy. Let's follow in his footsteps and actually see how it's done. So first of all, the idea is to develop a recursive algorithm to compute the areas of inscribed and circumscribed polygons, therefore squeezing the circle in between 
and squeezing the value of pi between the outer and the inner. Now, using this method and by hand alone, Archimedes actually managed to squeeze the value of pi to be between 3 10 over 71 and 3 1 7. Plug this into your calculator and see just how accurate that is, remembering that this was well before any calculators or any real modern methods of um, algebra. So how did he do it? We're going to see what the results there were. But before we do that, let's actually explore the general idea of this squeezing motion and what else we can prove using this method. Together with Eudoxus' method of exhaustion and this squeezing-inspired method of Archimedes, we can actually approximate the area of a circle. For that, we're going to start with a circle and inscribe polygons into it. We're going to focus on regular polygons because they're a little bit easier to actually analyze. So first we're going to inscribe a triangle, a square, a pentagon, and so on. It becomes very obvious very quickly that while the triangle doesn't really approximate the circle very well, the pentagon is already a pretty decent approximation. And in general, the more sides, the better. If I have teeny tiny little sides and lots of them, they will essentially trace the circle around, but in little straight lines. So what about we take this idea to the limit? This method of exhaustion of Eudoxus is essentially a modern idea of limit as the number of sides of the inscribed polygon goes to infinity. So for n sides, for generality, we're going to have a picture that looks something like this. We're going to have many, many, many sides, but because the polygon like that is going to be hard to analyze, what we're going to do is actually break it up into triangles. Triangulate it. This is a very common approach. The nice thing is we know lots of things about these triangles. In particular, let's zoom in on one of them where the radius is equal to two sides and see if we can um, figure something out from there. So zooming in on this one triangle, we know that this is the radius of the original circle. We have that the base is going to be this side here. And if we are after the area of the circle, we probably want to compute the area of this triangle, which means that we likely want to know the height. Then, of course, the familiar formula suggests that the area of this triangle is half base times height. Now, this is just one of these triangles, and if I am after n gone, that means that there's n of these sides, and therefore n of these triangles. So the general area of the entire n gone is going to be n of these little triangles. Now, again, thinking of the limits and the method of exhaustion. Exhaustion means that I'm essentially going to exhaust all of the areas I have not covered yet by making the sides smaller and smaller and smaller. I am going to think about what happens as I pack more and more triangles into this circle. So my triangles are becoming smaller and smaller. What's happening to their sides? What I can notice in particular is if these triangles are becoming smaller and smaller, I have that my height approaches my radius. Because what I end up with are these really, really skinny, teeny, tiny triangles, right? And their perpendiculars would be very, very close to their lateral sides. So the height is going to be close to the radius of the circle. And moreover, more importantly maybe, the perimeter of these sides, not the perimeter, but really the base is what I should have written here, actually approaches the circumference of the circle. So the summing of all of these bases of the triangles are going to give me an approximation for the circumference of the circle. Because we already introduced a bunch of notation, let's see what this actually means. What I have is that the perimeter of this fence, this base triangular fence all the way around. Again, remember there's n of these triangles and each base is equal to b. So the perimeter is going to be n times b. The circumference of the circle is of course the familiar to pi r. 
which is where the pi actually comes into play. This is a formula that defines the pi. Let's now go back to our areas. So what do we have? We have that the area of an n-gon, this inscribed n-gon consisting of n little triangles is equal to n times the area of each single triangle. Now, each single triangle has the area of one half base times height. But I now have this limiting condition that tells me that the more triangles I have, the more n times b approaches to pi r. And I actually have n times b here, and I have the expression for h. So if n times b approaches 2 pi r and h approaches r, I can simply replace these guys in the expression. So what am I going to get? I have 1 half 2 pi r times r, and that's my new expression for many, many, many little triangles. I notice that the 2s will cancel out, and overall I will have pi r times r, or pi r squared. That is, of course, what we know as the formula for the area of the circle. With nothing but triangles and the general idea of limitations or exhaustion, we have managed to follow the footsteps of Archimedes and Eudoxus to actually derive the area of the circle. Elementary methods are sometimes the most elegant ways to actually see some of these deep mathematical results. Now let's go back to the idea to think about how Archimedes actually developed a recursive algorithm, so something that can be applied again and again and again to whatever level of precision you want, to squeeze the value of pi. We're going to only talk about the circumscribed case, so the upper bound, and the inscribed case is very similar. So let's see. First of all, we're going to call upon this lemma that he actually proved. And again, this is the one for circumscribed polygons. Now, it's a bit of a mouthful, but the picture should help digest it. So what I have is a circle, and I have the radius OA, and I also have a tangent to the circle CA. If I take this point D so that DO bisects this angle here, so altogether I have that these two angles are the same, then what the lemma gives me is some kind of relationship between the existing line segments. So in particular, DA divided by OA is in some kind of proportion to CA, OC, and OA. And I also have relationship between DO, OA, and DA. The key here is to recognize that although DO is a angle bisector of this angle, it does not actually divide the side in half. So this is the key here. Angle bisector does not result in actually equal sides, which is why we need a bit more of a heavy machinery here. How can we use this? Let's apply this first to something a little tangible. Like, for example, if I circumscribe an actual hexagon, as I have in the picture here, that means that if I draw in my angle COA, so let's go through this together, maybe pause the video and actually pull out some kind of piece of paper and a pencil to be able to follow through. If this is my O, this is my A, this is my C, if altogether I have a hexagon, then this angle is equal to 30 degrees. The lemma then tells me that I'm going to bisect that into two. So I'm going to construct the angle bisector here. And this point D, again, being careful not to think that it's a midpoint between A and C, which it is not, this point D, the lemma is going to help me find where that actually is. Now, this is all great, but what else do I know about this picture? So first of all, I can decide on the radius of my circle because I am the constructor here. So I can, for example, set this to be a unit circle. So OA is equal to 1. And then, again, because I am starting with a uh, circumscribed hexagon, I know that the angle COA, this angle right here, is actually 30 degrees. So just from these two pieces of information, I can use relationship, I can basically use modern trigonometry, which of course Archimedes didn't quite use in the same way, 
but I can calculate several things. And in particular, I can calculate AC. I can calculate this side, knowing this side and the angle. And I can also calculate CO by the same sort of logic, right? So I can calculate CA and CO. Once I know those two things, I can know CA, OC, and so on. The lemma, these two results, will actually help me calculate DA and DO. The reason that's good is because I can do this process all over again. Once I know these two sides, it's the exact same picture, but magnified. So I can now focus in on this little triangle, bisect that even further, and do this all over again, therefore yielding an even better approximation. Right? So let's record this. Once I know this, you can use lemma to calculate the lengths of DA and DO. And we're actually going to do just that. It will get a little bit technical, but I wanted to go through a couple of steps by hand just to really showcase the strength of this result. So let's make the picture a little bit bigger and actually carry out the calculations. So I'm going to take this little triangle and draw it out in a larger version so I can see a little bit better what is going on. So this is my O, this is my A, this is going to be my C, and I have the side here. So what do I know in this picture? First of all, I know that OA is one, as I am sort of postulating this to be a unit circle. I also know that this angle is going to be 30 degrees. Right? Again, this is coming from the fact that I'm starting with an actual circumscribed hexagon. Then I'm going to bisect this angle. So now I know that each of these is 15 degrees and the point of bisection is going to be point D. All right, so maybe I'm going to step a little bit away from exactly how Archimedes actually did the next step, but how can I figure out what is CA and what is OC, knowing just this information. I encourage you to pause the video here and actually use modern trigonometry or anything like that in order to calculate, given the one side and the angle, the lengths of the other two sides. Pause it now, come back in a second. Okay, so again, depends on how you've actually approached it, but what you should be able to do is figure out the lengths of those two sides. Um, one easy thing to do is, for example, compute the tangent of this angle, and then you will see what numbers you get. What we should get for AC is 1 over root 3. So AC is 1 over root 3. And what we should get for OC is 2 over root 3. Now we're going to leverage the lemma that we actually have up here due to Archimedes. So the lemma will give us these two different expressions to calculate dA and dO, okay? We're gonna be able to figure out both of those values because we actually know everything else in those two expressions. So let's check this out. What do I have by my lemma? By lemma, I have, you know what? I'm gonna be lazy and actually copy it over. I have that dA, over OA is equal to this other expression here. And what I'm going to do is plug in all the things that I already know from above. Now, DA, I do not know. So I'm going to leave this as an unknown. OA is the radius of my circle is equal to one. Well, this is already proving to be quite nice because I'm actually just going to get the expression straight for DA. Um, CA so this entire side, which is equal to 1 over root 3. And on the bottom, I have OC, which is 2 over root 3 plus OA, which is once again 1. Okay, now I can apply some algebra, multiply by the conjugate, do common denominators, what not. 1 over 2 plus root 3. Not particularly interested in the actual decimal expansion of this, so I'm going to leave it like that. Now, notice that this is just one half of the lemma. On the other side, I also had the expression for DO 
to be computed. So I'm going to copy this over too. So now what we have is also by the lemma, but by the other half of it, I'm going to once again paste my expression here. DO is OA squared. So in my case, 1 squared plus DA squared. Well, this is convenient because I've just literally computed this expression. So I can plug this in. 1 over 2 plus square root of 3 all squared. And I mean, I can leave it like this or I can maybe simplify this expression a little bit. So maybe let me skip a couple of algebra steps. And it doesn't come out to be too beautiful, but what I end up with if we want to at least bring this together is this thing here. Now you'll see in a second why I actually want it to be one big fraction because this might actually help with um, the calculations coming up. All right, so I figured out what all of the sides of this little triangle are, including this new bisector. But what does this all mean for pi? Remember that I actually wanted to approximate pi using this method. Well, let's go back to think about how I've constructed this triangle that I've managed to find every single side in. This triangle lives inside this circumscribed hexagon. And as far as the circumscribed hexagon is concerned, the perimeter of it approximates the circumference of the circle. So in general, by the definition of pi, pi is actually approximately equal to the perimeter of my circumscribed, um, of my circumscribed hexagon divided by a diameter of the circle. That is, of course, because pi is actually defined to be the circumference of the circle divided by the diameter, and the perimeter here approximates the circumference. So that's why, of course, I'm not going to get the exact value of pi, but it's going to be pretty close because the perimeter of my hexagon is pretty close to the perimeter of my circle, which we call the circumference. Well, the good news is that the perimeter can be computed with what I have just found. So the perimeter of my circumscribed hexagon is equal to what? Let me scroll back up to this picture right here. I know the length of the side AC. This is something that I've been able to figure out. Double that side will give me one side of the hexagon and six of them will be the entire perimeter. Okay, so careful with the calculations here. I'm going to have that one side of the hexagon is double the value of CA and six of them will give me the entire perimeter. The diameter, of course, let's see. The diameter I'm also gonna use of the actual perimeter, of the actual hexagon, because that will make my approximation better. So the diameter is going to be twice this value of OC. Two times OC. Well, I can cancel things out and carry out the computations with the numbers that I have just found. And I'm going to find out that in this first case, I'm going to get the value of 3. So the very first approximation of pi using this method yields a number 3. Well, that's not bad, but given how much heavy machinery I threw at it, it's a little bit disappointing. But you got to remember that the power of this machinery in its recursiveness, in the fact that we can iterate this process, so I can repeat it again, but on a smaller triangle. And in fact, I already have everything about that particular triangle that I need. So if I think about introducing this new thing, so splitting each of these triangles further into two, I move from the circumscribed hexagon to circumscribed 12-gon. Let's carry out the calculations for that. So for 12-gon, what are we going to have? We're going to have the exact same thing. It's going to be approximately perimeter of the 12 gon over the diameter of the 12 gon. But because we already have most of those things in place, let's think about how that's going to work out. For the 12 gon, I'm going to have this as half of its side. So the entire perimeter is going to be twice of DA, which is one side, one full side of a 12 gon. And there is 12 sides, so I got to multiply by 12 divided by the diameter, and the diameter is going to be this length right here. So OD times 2. 
right? So this is analogous to our computations here, but I went from 6 gone to 12 gone in one step, okay? Now, the good news is that I actually already have all of these values. This is my value for DA that I can plug in here, and this guy is my value for OD, and this is why I actually simplified it to be one fraction, because I can plug that in. So after a little bit of plugging things in, I can get the exact expression to be 12 divided by square root of 2 plus root 3 squared plus 1. And if we want a decimal expansion, this is approximately 3.1058 and so on. Not bad at all. Now that I have this in place, I can continue to break up my little triangles. So I can break this one even further, and I'm going to use the exact same calculations to get the next value of pi. And I'm going to break that one even further and do this again and again and again. Because the method is repetitive, and recursive, you're going to see the exact same repetitions. So the math is no longer heavy, it's just algebra. The heavy lifting has been done by proving this lemma and something about the relationship of the angles and the triangles in, with respect to the circle. But after that, it's just brute force computations. The amazing thing is that to obtain his approximation, Archimedes actually went to 96 gone, which gave him his approximation of the pi bounded between 317 and 31071. Okay, imagine how much patience he had to go to 96 gone. The man was a genius, but also worked hard at his mathematics. Review this method, appreciate the basic foundational mathematics that went into developing it, but how far what can take method of exhaustion ideas to approximate pi and so much more.